My name is Javon. Um, I am Panamanian American and I'm from New York. Um, I am a musician and um, I'd say a community organizer here in Copenhagen. Uh, I moved down here two years ago um, from Aarhus, so I've been in Denmark for around four years. Your name is Javan. I've got one of musician that I really like from yeah. Brazil. Yeah, I'm is named your after. Name, yeah, 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 like <laughs> yeah. Is your name come from that musician? Yes, yeah, he's the he's Afro-Brazilian from Bahia and yeah, my um my parents named me after him basically. When you say that uh, you are a musician community organizer, what do you identify most as a musician community organizer or both? And can you also explain what is community organizer? Community yeah. Organizer um so I think when it comes to community organizing, I'm not implying that hmm, I'm not implying that I'm like uh, making all these big moves or something like that. But there's just been some events within the um, black community and also the queer community that I've been involved in. Um, so helping out with just different sauna events for queer people or my main thing that I used to do before Corona happened was black coffee which was um, just a space that me and the founder of Black Lives Matter, Walia, created together where black people could just come and chill and, and drink coffee and stuff. Um, I would definitely say I'm more of a musician than a community organizer um, because music is what I do 365 days of the week, basically. Um, and I said community organizer because I was kind of embraced by a community here in Copenhagen of people of color and stuff and was allowed to kind of take part in um, events and, and do a lot of building for people here. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. All right, we're going to talk about the music, we're going to talk about all the things that you do, but before then, question is, why Denmark? Why Denmark? Um, I was living in Spain at the time and I was looking for a place to do my master's. And um, I want, I had lived in the UK before, so I didn't want to go back to the UK. So I was thinking about more schools and countries I could do in the mainland. So I just narrowed it down between Denmark and Germany based on their level of English capabilities, um, as well as the price of their college tuitions. And um, my step-grandmother is Danish. Uh, I grew up with her. She has been in the US since 1971. And I basically called her up and asked her what she thought. And she was like, you should go to Denmark. So here I am, <laughs> basically. <laughs> How it is uh, being, uh, I mean, growing up in, uh, in New York, where you come from? Um, it was good and it was also bad, I'd say. Um, the good parts was the diversity that I was allowed to have access to um, in the neighborhood that I grew up. It was, you know, 30 percent white, 30 percent black, 30 percent Latino and of all different economic classes, basically. And so I was able to the, the beauty about living in New York is that you're able to be so um, relativist with every culture and stuff like that because there are so many different cultures all coming together um, that there was hard for there to be a cultural supremacy in some ways. The bad side um, about growing up in New York is I was very segregated. So like I said, it was 30% black, 30% Latino, and then 30% white, but in the school that I went to, because I lived on the north side of the neighborhood, the north end, I was one of six kids of color to graduate in my middle school. Um, and it was, uh, it was incredibly difficult to be in such a segregated area and stuff because my family, we were the only ones that were kind of able to um, break into that neighborhood. And they made it very, very clear to us that we weren't welcome. So we had the cops called on us all the time for just like the most ridiculous stuff, like having our grass being too long or, or anything like that. Um, I was treated really poorly by my white teachers, particularly the, the female white teachers and stuff. And I never really understood what was going on. I never understood what was happening to me until I actually left the country and realized that all this stuff, I wasn't a bad kid just inherently. It was just I was being treated badly because of the way I was born, essentially. So I kind of view New York as like the best of 
worlds and the worst of worlds in the sense that like you can get that amazing diversity and culture and music and all that type of stuff but it still is like the perfect example of northern racism and segregation essentially i want to just to explore a little bit about you said that for example when you were a child you see like uh, uh, cops or neighbor call the cops on you because the grass is up mm -hmm. and all those things mm -hmm. as a child having this kind of experience how it was when we were younger it was a joke which is the weird part so like um it was yeah i don't know we just laughed at it like oh here come the cops again like oh we got pulled over again oh we got kicked out of the pool club again and stuff like that um and i think my parents kept it light on purpose so that we wouldn't kind of it wouldn't hit us with like how messed up the whole entire situation was and stuff um yeah so it was only when i left the country and really got to sit and think about what what that was what that was in actuality that's when i started getting angry basically mm. but i think my parents kept a light for us on purpose so that we wouldn't let it get to us so the black culture in new york because it's the birthplace of hip-hop and stuff um so the black culture is very strong because we're segregated so it's we're all stuck in these different neighborhoods together like it's the blacks and latinos we are together and stuff and that's why it was black people and latinos that created hip-hop so um we're able to maintain this culture because we are very separate um from from white america and stuff like even the we have a different dialect we have different food we have different style the way that we talk and all that type of stuff is completely different because we're separated and that's why our culture is so strong and not watered down mm. and that's what that's where you get this uh, ability of uh, seeing or the way you're doing because of that uh, mm -hmm. uh, richness of the culture in new york or, yeah or how you came up uh, Mm -hmm. having this uh, ability of uh, uh, singing see uh to sing yeah you. um i my father is a musician um he's a producer for uh most deaf and talib kali they were famous uh rappers back in the day um his father was a calypso musician back in panama um because my family's origins in panama are from barbados so there's a strong like caribbean music culture in my family um my mother she cannot sing, she's not a musician, um, but she strongly encouraged us to pursue music. So from the age of eight, she had me in violin lessons and was always encouraging me to join bands and stuff. Um, and I actually grew up more as a classical musician um, and then as a rock musician playing in guitar, like playing guitar in bands and stuff like that more than, more than anything. Um, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now let's talk a little bit about your career as a musician. Uh, how that? How did it start? It. Um. It. I guess it started when I, because I had mentioned when I was younger, I was always in bands and in in orchestras and stuff. And then, um, I think I started seriously making music, making music, um, in 2015. So around five years ago. Um, I had just graduated college and I've always been an instrumentalist and, and wrote songs for bands and stuff, but I felt very lost once I graduated because I got my master's in history and then did a, a minor in music theory and composition. Um, and I was living in Spain at the time and I was completely by myself and I couldn't really speak the language. Um, and I was stuck for just two months straight, not knowing anyone, not talking to anybody. I got a guitar for my graduation and I just felt lost because I was just like, I didn't know where I wanted to go in life because I was a bit afraid to just be like, yo, I want to do music and then that's it. Um, because obviously there's not really a lot of money in music. Um, and my mom broke her back so I could get a good get a good education and all that. So I felt a bit guilty being like, okay, I'm just gonna throw everything to the wind, be a musician. Um, but I realized that I wouldn't be happy if I did anything else. So I felt like I had to do it basically, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, 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 yeah for sure, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how it is so far <clears throat> since uh, uh, you started five years ago mm -hmm. till today, how it is your development of your career? Um, career, that's funny. Cause like, 
I haven't released anything yet. I'm coming up with uh, stuff in the summer that I'm going to release and all that, but I've been playing a lot of live shows, um, been doing a lot of like stuff in the background, making a lot of music with people, doing a lot of great collaborations, and I'm very happy right now um, with what I'm doing and the space that I'm in and the people that I've met and the products that I've been able to create from it. So I'm not famous yet who knows <laughs> but I, I i don't like to value fame as like a way for me to assess my career i think i've i've gone far and i have a lot more to do basically how it is uh living in in, in denmark um i would say it's it's also good and bad like uh when i moved to denmark i moved to Aarhus in jutland and um i met some cool people there but I also met some not cool people there. Um, a lot of the time at Aarhus, the students that are there are from like the smaller areas in, in Jutland. So I was the first black person that a lot of people interacted with. And I dealt with, like in the US, I dealt with a lot of like systemic institutional racism. But the first time anyone had ever called me a nigger was in Aarhus. And that happened like four or five times in my first year that I was there. Um, and it was this type of just like cozy racism where I was the one who was tripping if I was just like, yo, that's not cool. And I was the one who's known as like the angry black person because I didn't like black jokes and stuff. And um, so I was really miserable there, to be honest. And one of the reasons why I left Aarhus was that was that was just the main reason was because I couldn't I felt my blackness just being solely just uh restricted when I was there and um, yeah I got into a really toxic relationship and stuff so I came to Copenhagen and I was just like I need to find some more people of color here and thankfully I met so many people in the community of color and the the queer spaces and stuff like that that just welcomed me with open arms so um, it's been so much better like coming to Copenhagen. It's it's been like really just completely changed my view of what Denmark is like essentially. That's no state to Jutland, but in Copenhagen there's a lot more diversity and stuff. It's still in Jutland I felt very like much like I couldn't get in touch with the Danes. They're very closed off and here I feel that too, but at least there are more immigrants that are more open here. You said that it was your first time to be called the N word here in Denmark? Mm-hmm. Oh, that is... Yeah, yeah, I, I spent the first 24 years of my life having never been called that word before. And that happened to me so many times when I was up in Jutland. Never, ever happened to me in the U.S. Never. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a hoon and a holler, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> wow. Um, so, how used to be black in Denmark? Um... From the experience that you've got and yeah i would say for me as a black american my blackness and my blackness and my i repeat that my blackness and my experience in denmark is different from um africans experience of blackness in denmark so obviously like when I was up in Jutland, it was very difficult being the only black person and having to deal with all of that, just like outward racism and the jokes and stuff. But um, when I came to Copenhagen, it was weird because in the U.S., like black people, we were always just considered at like the bottom of the, the social totem pole and stuff. And then in Copenhagen, not only was I not... I, I had some privileges because of my Americanness and because of my accent and because of my skin tone and stuff like that. So like, I am black here, but I feel like I am treated better than the way I am back home because of my Americanness and, and because of the way I look and stuff. So it was weird because, yeah, I just, for me, I've seen way more like Islamophobia, for example, than anti-blackness. And this is not obviously to compare and who has it worse or struggle Olympics or anything like that. But I can't deny that I've had it easier than a lot of people of color here. 
different experience from uh, one person to the other. And yeah. That's, that's part of it. Uh, yeah. Because the there's anti-blackness here 100% and there's mm -hmm. racism. And I, I dealt with racism at the workplace and, and all that type of stuff. And it's bad. And I'm not saying Denmark doesn't have a problem with anti-blackness. But I'm saying as my experience as a black American, it's been bad. But it hasn't been as bad as my peers basically mm. but uh, how do you see uh, uh denmark some people say that the the racism that is in denmark is kind of a uh, hidden compared mm -hmm. to uh, in new york or in america where it's more open like mm -hmm. uh, you say that i know how to deal with a white person yeah uh, in america because yeah. you know, that is, is my enemy here yeah someone can give you a smile and yet it's not it yeah like you yeah that's the thing like in america i feel like my black body isn't safe But I feel like in Denmark, my black mind isn't safe, you know? So I feel like the psychological violence that happens to black people here is the, the main thing that's the issue and stuff. It's the constant second guessing, the constant like, oh, wow, your Danish is really good. Or the, the constant, you know, undermining of black bodies. But it's the fact that Danes don't ever, they don't even have the language to realize how racist that they are, that they're denying it so much. And a lot of the African friends that I've met here, they were like, now we're all coming together in Copenhagen, but they grew up in just separate and completely isolated and stuff. So my heart always breaks when I hear about the stories that my black friends have here of just the stuff that kids would say to them. And then they also didn't have that language to be like, okay, that's racist and that's wrong. They have the language where they're like, okay, I just need to assimilate. I just need to become Danish. I just need to get a white partner or something like that instead. Um, so yeah, that's that's the thing that's been very odd. I, I've noticed here is I'm not saying that there isn't anti-blackness, it's just insidious here, it's quiet. And that's the thing that is scary about the, the racism in Denmark. I like you here. Thank you. Really nice. <laughs> Yusuf, why do you like to have this Kind of, uh, I mean, embrace the natural hair, mm -hmm. not uh, using the perms or perms anything. And all this, uh... Um, I I perm my hair from the age of eleven to sixteen. So I have permed my hair before, but the reason why I chopped it all off was I saw this documentary about good hair, and it made me realize just like how much we're taught to be ashamed of our our hair texture and all that, and. Um, when I was 16, everything that I thought was like the mainstream, I try to go against. So I'm like, okay, so me as a 16 year old, the mainstream was having permed hair. So let me go against that. Let me chop off all my hair. And, um, the reason why I never went back is because I just, I fell in love with my hair and, um, I just, it just, my hair just feels like it's just pure life. You know, it doesn't lie flat. It grows to the sun and stuff like plants do, you know? Um, so yeah, I've just, I've just always liked my hair. Um, and I never really, weirdly enough, like wanted it to be that much of a political statement or anything like that, but it's just, yeah, because I like it. <laughs> That's the, the main reason, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, uh, I mean, I ask this question because the many girls, they really hate their mm -hmm. hair. They really don't like to have an afro because they say that yeah. it's take a long time to prepare and mm -hmm. all the things yeah. so that I understand. But uh, Like granted to like, I rarely wear my hair out like this because it does take a long time and my hair is best when it's in like protective styles and stuff. So like 80% of the time I'll put my hair in braids or like I'll have like, I'll usually cornrow this hair down or something like that. Um, but then also sometimes I don't wear my hair out because there's, especially since it's this crazy color too, um, there have been times where I've been sitting on the bus and I just feel like hands coming behind me and touching my hair and they feel like they, that I wouldn't notice or something, but like obviously I do notice. Um, And so a lot of the times I like do keep my hair in protective styles just because I'm just like, I, I don't want to have it out. But when it's summertime and it's warmer out and my hair loves the humidity, then I'll have my hair out a lot more. So it's more just a vanity thing <laughs> like to, to feature. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for coming. Yes, thanks. <laughs>